um, every couple of weeks, we have a little statement that I say from up front, and I haven't said it in a while. Um, and it kind of lets you know, uh, no matter where you're at, we are really glad that you're here today. So we have a little saying that goes something like this. We really don't care why you're here today um, because we believe the good news is, is that you can come as you are. And the good news is that none of us have to stay that way. We don't care at South Point where you've been because we believe the good news is, is God is more concerned about where you and I are going than where we've been. And lastly, we believe this is the greatest news. We don't care what's been done by you or to you. Here's the greatest news to ever happen to planet Earth is failure. My failure, your failure, our failure, or failure done to us does not have to define us, but that Jesus can define us. So if you only walk away and hear one thing this morning, we hope that you hear that you matter deeply to God at South Point. Now, hey, I'm gonna start off this message by asking a very dangerous question. And the reason that this question is dangerous is because when I ask you this question, the answer may lead you to not coming back to South Point Church. And so that's a pretty dangerous question for a pastor, you know, live on video and like to the congregation to go, hey, listen, I'm gonna ask a question. And the answer to it may mean that you, you may not show back up. But here's what I discovered, that's really okay. Hey, because listen, I've understood something really important that South Point isn't the only really good church and that there are other good churches. And so you might be going, what is this dangerous question that might cause us to leave? And here's the question that I wanna ask is, why would you, why would you stay at South Point? I mean, can we just all be honest? Like life is busy, isn't it? Like not just say amen, life is busy, right? Like, and time is really valuable. I always say this, listen, if I wasn't the senior pastor, I would always come to the 11 o'clock service because I love sleep, right? Like, listen, so your time is valuable. Life is busy. And so I want to ask a question. Why would you stay at South Point? I mean, let me phrase it this way. Why would you stay at South Point and then show up? I mean, you could have other things you do. Why would you stay at South Point and serve? I mean, we have lots of volunteers. We could always use more volunteers. Never think that we have enough. Why would you serve? And then why would you sacrificially give or, or partner with us in the things to do? Why, why would you stay at South Point Church? And here's what I wanna know. This is a pretty fair question. Like this is, this is actually a good and fair question. But I wonder if I was honest, how many of us have really wrestled and understand the answer to this question of why we stay at South Point. And my hope for this is by the time we're done with this message is that you'll understand either this is a place for you or maybe that you should find a different place. And, and like I said, I discovered the church doesn't belong to me. It belongs to Jesus. I know lots of good, other good pastors in this community. And if, if this isn't a good fit for you, please let me know. We wanna help connect you to a church that is a fit for you. And so I kinda wanna let you know why maybe you would want to stay at South Point. But I want to kind of describe that in kind of a backwards way. I want to tell you what South Point really kind of isn't about so that you can kind of know what we are about. I sometimes find that the easiest way to describe something. And, and here's what I mean. South Point isn't a church where you check the box. I think some of us maybe grew up in church. Maybe some of us grew up in religion. Maybe some of us grew up to church. And church is where you went and checked the box. You checked the box for showing up. You checked the box for serving. And you checked the box for putting something in the plate or, you know, giving online. You kind of did that. And here's kind of what we hope, that if we check enough boxes on Sundays, that it will outweigh all the minuses through the rest of the week. And when we get to heaven, we'll get there because we check the... But here's what Jesus came. Jesus says, you don't get to have a relationship with God because you checked the box. Listen, here's what I want you to do. No one can earn their way to heaven or Jesus wouldn't have had to die on the cross. Listen, here's what I discovered. The only way to get to heaven is through grace, by faith in a person named Jesus. He died. We get to go to heaven, not because we showed up, not because we served, not because we gave, but because of what Jesus did on the cross because the tomb is empty. Now, I also want to let you know, South Point is not into religion. And you might be like, you're a church, right? This is South Point Church. And I go, yes, it's a church. But as a church, we're not into religion. Matter of fact, I would say, if you read the eyewitness accounts of Jesus, do you know who Jesus, the people that got mad at Jesus the most were the religious people. It's because Jesus always came and he said, listen, you think that religiosity and spirituality make you right with God. So if I come to church and I do some rituals and I'm spiritual, then then I have a good relationship with God, but I can treat other people how I want to. And Jesus messed that all up. When Jesus came, he came to the religious elite and he said, you don't get it. If you say you love God, you can't be religious. You can't be ritual. You can't have spiritual and then treat people the way you want to be right this way 
you have to be right this way. Because all people matter deeply to God. If we have a relationship with God, it should be evidenced by the way that we treat people around us. So at South Point, we're really not into religion. And at South Point, we're really not into making people feel good. I have a regular statement that I hear at South Point, which is buckle up. Jesus came full of grace and truth in that order. Hey man, anyone is welcome to come be here. All of us are busted and broken. But at some point, if we want different in our life, we need to change direction. And love is a choice. God will not make you make that choice. But listen, many of us show up going, listen, I want my life to be different. We all want our life to be different. But for our life to be different requires all of us to change direction. That means instead of forming God into our image, we need to be made into the image that God already is. So we're not here to check a box. We're not here to play religion, and we're not here just to feel good. And I discovered about churches, churches typically fall into a couple categories, and these are kind of made up categories, and, and they're kind of extreme categories, but I think you'll kind of get the point. And, and I hope that for South Point, the first three categories that I share with you, I hope that we'll never ever fall into these. And the first category, I call it the Burger King church. It's the club church. I want it my way. I want to go to a church where they play my kind of music, where they give me a message the way I like to hear it that never makes me really uncomfortable, that never really challenges me. Maybe it gives me new information every week, but never really challenges me to live differently outside. I want a church that believes in my political things. I want a church that values what I value. I want my church to be a club that likes the things I love. And if it doesn't give me what I want, then I'm finding a different church. We call that the Burger King Club. And if we are really honest, for some churches, that's the way it is. It's, it's you get what you want. And there's another kind of church. I call it the click church. And this might offend some of you, but it's the kind of church where you show up and everybody looks exactly like you. They have the same skin color. They vote the same. They look the same. They act the same. They have all these same things. And you're never ever around other people who are different than you to be challenged or to grow or to understand that diversity isn't a bad word. And I call that the kind of click. Do you know Sunday is still the most divided hour in our country? And then there's the cause church. It's the church that we go and we join because they have so many outreach things, so many things that are involved outside. And we like that kind of church because then we never actually have to focus on change ourselves. We're gonna change the world out there. We're just never gonna really worry about ourselves. But there's actually a fourth option, a kind of church that I hope that we would strive to be. Now, I wanna admit from up front that we are not perfect, that we have flaws, that we miss it, that I miss it. But this is the church that I hope and dream that we would be, that we would be a community on a cause. And what I mean by community is it would be a group of people that actually cares about each other and that connects with each other and grows in our relationship with Jesus. But that we all sign up and understand that our story is meant to be a part of a bigger story, that we give ourselves something bigger than our own private lives, that we would give ourselves away. If you've come to South Point for any length of time, I always make this phrase, the world is a busted and broken place. And everybody says, amen, right? You just go on Instagram, Facebook, you know, the news. You just live in this world and the world is a busted and broken place. The world around us is in desperate need of hope. The world's in desperate need of a savior. The world needs the answer that Jesus is. If I was gonna put it this way, I would say this. Jesus is such a big deal at South Point that we put ourselves, what's that? At South Point, we believe Jesus is such a big deal, we put ourselves second so others can see him. We actually believe that Jesus is the solution. The solution is not our political parties. The solution is not more wealth. The solution is not education. The solution is not technology. The solution is found in a personal relationship with Jesus. That is what will fix this busted and broken world. And those that believe that are willing to put themselves second so that the world can see it. The church does not exist for itself. It exists for the world around it. Which leads me to an opening truth this morning that if you wanna fall off, church is not a place to huddle or hide. It's not where we get together and go, hooray, the world's going to hell in a handbasket, but lucky for us, let's just all be glad we're together. Too bad for them. Or, hey, let's hide. The world's a big bad place out there. Let's, let's just, this is, oh, they're bad and scary, so let's just all hide together and pretend that that's not true. No, it's a rescue mission. The church isn't meant to be a place where we 
just are a club. We're just a clique. We're just a cause. No, we're meant to be a community on a rescue mission. You see, South Point was started with kind of a crazy idea. And it's that Jesus and Jesus alone is the answer to what's broken. In a world desperate for hope and truth and love, the answer is found in Jesus. And that's what our whole Launching a Legacy initiative is really all about. It's about building our first permanent church campus, our first church home. Not so we can huddle, not for us to be convenient, not even for us to actually have air conditioning in the summertime. It'll be great though. No, no, no. Our first permanent campus is meant to be a launch pad into our communities for Jesus-led life change that will impact generations to come. And people ask about our Lusby campus, and we go, we love our Lusby campus. We want to keep our Lusby campus open. We dream someday of having a permanent campus in Lusby. And this whole idea of having a permanent platform where we can launch Jesus-led life change into our community isn't really my idea. And it leaves me asking a question that I kind of want to ask today, and, and it would be this. What kind of church would you really want to be a part of? I mean, What kind of church is it that you go, yes, I want to be a part of a church like that? And it got me thinking, do you want to be a part of a church that gives to InterVarsity? And you might be asking, well, what's InterVarsity? InterVarsity is a Christian organization that works on college campuses. And South Point currently gives to InterVarsity here in our community because we have a college, College of Southern Maryland and St. Mary's College. And we have people, and, and, and InterVarsity has people on those helping College kids who are usually walking away from the faith know that there's a God who loved them and made them and wants to be the friend. Would you want to be a part of a church that gives to pregnancy care center? So when women get pregnant and they're scared and they're worried and the world tells them that death is the okay choice, that they can go and hear that life is beautiful and that life matters deeply to God. Would you want to be a part of a church that financially gives to an organization called Hope? Hope is a group of churches that all pull their money together. So when people are in distress and they can't pay their medical bills or their oil bill or their electric bill, they can go there and know the Christian community cares about them. Would you want to be a part of a church that gives to an organization called Young Life? It's a Christian organization that goes to where high school students are, into the schools, the middle school and high school students, to tell the generation that is leaving the church the fastest that there's a God who made them and loves them and wants to be their friend? Would you want to be a part of a church that buys a dilapidated townhouse in the under-resourced community and rehabs that and builds an after-school program so that those kids in that community have the same chance that you and I have? True story. I was talking to one of our leaders for our after-school program, and I asked them how it went. They said it was a great day. Things went really well. And they went on to share this story and they were saying, yeah, it was a really good day. It was really well attended, except there was this one regular child that that wasn't there. And I said, oh, and they said, yeah, I was really worried because this child's pretty regular. And because we've been in that community seven years, we've been in this community seven years partnering with him. God was already there. God just allowed us to partner with what he's already doing. So we've been there seven years. And so this leader had a relationship with the family. So after the after school program was over, this leader went to, to the home and knocked on the door and the mom came to the door and she said, hey, um, no pressure, um, but this, this child wasn't at the after school program. I just wanted to make sure that you're okay and your child's okay and everything's okay. And the mom said, yes, thank you for stopping by. Um, this child's been having problems at school. And the only thing that this child values is the after school program. So we literally had to put them on restriction from the after school program to help them do better in school. Would you want to be a part of a church that has relationships like that? Would you want to be a part of a church that financially resources marriages in crisis to get professional marriage counseling when they're on the brink? South Point does that on a regular basis. Would you want to be a part of a church that recruits and trains and sends out Stevens ministers so that when people experience hardship or there maybe is a death in the family or maybe there's a disability or maybe they're just in a tough spot and they need someone to talk to, that they can go to someone who's been trained. They're not a counselor, but can have a Christian friend to walk through during that difficult season. Would you want to be a part of a church that every year gives away hundreds and hundreds of one-year Bibles for free? I got stopped in the hallway the other day. Someone said, hey, Pastor Matt, thank you. 
And I, I said, for what? And they said, well, for the one year Bible. And I go, oh, our church does that every year. And they said, and, and they were kind of a middle-aged person. And that's what old people say about kind of middle-aged people. And young people call them old. And when you get to my age, they're middle-aged. But anyway, this, this middle-aged person said, you know, it was the first time in my life that I read through the whole Bible because of that one year Bible. Do you want to be a part of a church where 50% of the adult attendance is connected in small groups outside the Sunday experience to build friendships and relationships and to grow in their faith? Do you want to be a part of a church where there are middle school environments every Sunday at every campus at every service so that middle school kids, when they're going through the hardest seasons, do you remember sixth, seventh, and eighth grade? Know that there's a God who made them and loves them and cares for them. Do you want to be a part of a church that takes trips to big stuff and has a youth group so that high school students, as they go through a difficult season, know that there's a God who's partnering with them? Do you want to be a part of a church where every Sunday at South Point, there are over 200 fifth grade and below at the South Point campuses every Sunday? Did you know in America, the average size of the church is 100 people. We have double that just in our children's missions where kids are growing up knowing that they were made. They're not an accident. They're knowing that there's a God who loves them and they're knowing that Jesus came to be their friend. Do you want to be a part of a church that does that? Do you want to be a part of a church where every week there are about 35 new visitors that show up every Sunday to hear that God loves them and is for them. Do you want to be a part of a church that through their baptisms, if you took their baptisms that we do them about twice a year, if you took the total people they got baptized and you kind of split it out over the 52 weeks, did you know that we baptize over one person every Sunday annually here at South Point? Would you want to be a part of a church where the last year 108 people said yes to Jesus for the very first time? Is that a church you want to be a part of? Let me put that in context for you. In America, half of churches in America don't lead a single person to Jesus. At South Point, almost every Sunday, two people say yes to Jesus. And the scripture tells us when we say yes to Jesus, we've crossed from death to life. South Point is that and much more. And if you are moved by any of those things, then you are at the right place. And if none of those things stirred your soul, if none of those things said, that's what I want to be a part of, then this might not be the place for you. Because at the end of the day, the answer to the bust and the brokenness is a person named Jesus. And we ripped off this whole idea of creating a place for people to see Jesus straight from the Bible. It's not my idea. I stole it. Matter of fact, everything that I have is stolen. I either stole it from the Bible or other really smart people. And then my job is just to pass it on to you. So if you ever think anything well of me, just don't go, oh, he's a really good thief. That's what I'm good at. (laughs) But this whole idea of creating a place, a launching legacy, a platform really comes from this eyewitness account that we find in the historical account of the Gospel of Luke. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. It's Luke 19, one through 10. It's on the back of your insert. It's gonna be up on the screen. But it says, Jesus entered Jericho as he was passing through. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to do a little bit of old school preaching where I read a little bit and then I talk to you a little bit, okay? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And for most of us church people, we've probably heard that. We're probably ready to skip right past it. But I want you to catch, Jesus didn't wait for people to come to him. Jesus went to where the people. You see, God is never willing to just wait for people to come to him. Jesus left the comfort of heaven to reach people who were lost and far. A man there was by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. Now, most of us, we read that, we just go, oh, he worked for the IRS. I'm glad he had a good paying job. But that's not really the context here. Zacchaeus is a Jewish man. That's a Jewish name. And the nation, the nation of Israel had been overrun or conquered by the Romans. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector for the Romans. The way the Romans paid for their army, the way the Romans paid for their government was as they would conquer countries and then take taxes from them. And Zacchaeus was a Jew who was a tax collector for the Romans. And the way that he became wealthy is he extorted extra taxes from his own people. He was a traitor and a thief and he was despised. Matter of fact, tradition tells us that in in those times when there was someone who was a tax collector, the other Jewish people would not even walk on the same side of the road as a tax collector. And if they did, they would often spit in their face. And we continue on with this encounter. He, Zacchaeus, wanted to see Jesus. Now I want to stop here. I bet you can think some people that you go, I bet they don't want anything to do with Jesus. I am surprised at the number of people who are really interested in Jesus. What I've discovered, people are not interested in religion. 
People are not interested in angry Christians or judgmental Christians. They are really interested in Jesus of the Bible. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. There were some circumstances that were causing him not to be able to see Jesus. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. There were same things hindering Zacchaeus. He said, I got an idea. I'm going to go to this place where it's safe and it's easy and I'll be able to see Jesus up and close. Now, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. Now, you and I read that and we think, oh, isn't that sweet of Jesus? You do not understand how shocking and violent this statement was to all the people around Jesus. First, this is one of the only times Jesus ever invites himself somewhere. I do that all the time. Can I come, can I come with you? Where, where are you going? I'd, I'd like to go, please. That's how I make friends, right? But this is one of the few times that Jesus actually invites, but Jesus invites himself. And here's what you and I need to understand about this. When you ate a meal in a person's home in first century Jewish context, that meant that you were friends. The only person that you let in your home was a fellow Jew, was someone that you considered a friend. And typically in that society, in those rules, once someone entered your house to have a meal, they became your responsibility. If someone ever came to attack them or harm them, you would sacrifice your life and your family to protect them because they came into your home. They were your friend. Jesus invited him to a relationship that everyone else went, whoa, 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 whoa. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He is going to be the guest of a sinner. And this is really interesting to me because I think this is what many of us think. Man, I wish my, you were all thinking of someone like, oh, I wish this friend and they're a real sinner. I wish they'd show up. And, and I just want to remind us that we're, we're all sinners. Like, okay, y'all, y'all missed that one. We're, we're all sinners. Like the last time I checked, there are no perfect people. If you're perfect, run, we will mess you up, right? There are no perfect people. Every single person here has made a mistake. Every single person here has done something they knew was wrong. Every single person has not done something that was right, that was protective, that we were supposed to do. We've not only committed sins of commission, but of omission. There are no perfect people. We're all sinners. The people around Jesus forgot that they were sinners and that Jesus was hanging out with them due to grace and grace alone. He's gone to be with that person. And I wonder if the church has lost. And we say, they're the problem. Jesus, you wanna hang out with that guy? Because that guy's the problem. It goes on to say this. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay you back four times the amount. I mean, stunning. I mean, it was audacious that Jesus would invite himself to hang out with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' response is miraculous. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And then look at Jesus' response. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to the south. See, many of us think of salvation the wrong way. We think of salvation as like getting to heaven. Salvation means we get put back together the way that God originally intended us to be. We become who we were meant to be in Christ. Salvation can begin in the here and now. Salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to condemn and to yell at the, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I read that wrong. For the son of man came to huddle and hide with those who, oh, so I keep reading it, I'm sorry, I'm just not doing really good today. For the son of man came to what? And save the, now, you know the word Christian means to be like Christ. Okay, I got, okay, everyone nod. To be a Christian means to be like Christ, right? So if Christ came to seek and save the lost, then what are his followers supposed to do? You, you, see, you see where I'm getting. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. There's three little observations about this that I want to point us out. And first one is this. Life creates obstacles to seeing God for who he really is. I mean, Zacchaeus couldn't help that he was born short, could he? But it was one of the reasons he couldn't see over the crowd. And I bet every single person, whether at Lusby or online or here, has had a circumstance that at one point in life caused you to not be able to see God for who he really was. Maybe you were born into the family where one of your parents was an addict. Maybe when you were in elementary or middle school, your parents got divorced. Maybe when you were younger, there was a death in the family that rocked your world. Maybe it was some event in college or in high school, where you didn't earn it, you didn't deserve it, it wasn't a choice, it was a circumstance. 
and you couldn't see God because of that circumstance. It wasn't just a circumstance that kept Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus, it was his choices. And I wonder how many of us, it's hard to see God because of our choices. I know you smart, wonderful people maybe never have done what I've done, but I've often done this in my life. I've often made a stupid choice and then when I get the stupid consequence, I go, God, why don't you love me? Am I the only one that's ever done that? You see, true love means that you have choice and choice creates consequences. Sometimes we make a bad choice and then when we get the bad consequence, we go, God, don't you love me? Aren't you supposed to bail me out when I make stupid choices? And he's like, no, that's what love is. I give you the ability to make choices. And sometimes we can't see God because of our choices. And the third thing that kept Zacchaeus from keep seeing Jesus is one of the things that keeps us, it's the crowd. It's the crowd that claims to know Christ. Maybe for you, it was a boss. A boss that said, I'm a Christian, and then cheated and treated you poorly. Maybe it was a coach or a teacher that said they were a Christian and they were mean and cruel. Maybe you married someone who said they were a Christian and they betrayed and harmed you. You see, I think the same three reasons that kept Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus are the same three reasons that keep you and I from seeing Jesus today. Circumstances, choices, and the crowd. And the funny thing is Zacchaeus actually wanted to see Jesus. I've rarely run into a person who said, I wouldn't mind seeing God for who he really is. Which leads me directly to observation number two, which is this, the tree became a platform that launched a friendship. The tree was this safe place where Zacchaeus could see Jesus from afar, but close enough where he can make a choice. And I wonder, isn't that what church maybe should be? Maybe church should be a place where anyone can come no matter why, no matter where they've been, no matter what's been done, maybe they could come and they could sit in a safe, relevant place and they could hear and see a God who made them and loved them and died for them and wants to be their friend. And this platform, a simple tree, it was just a tree. There was nothing special about a tree. It was just a place for him to sit. But what's amazing is not only did Zacchaeus get to see Jesus, but Jesus saw Zacchaeus, and I wonder how many people are hurting out in the world going, does God see me? And what would it, like, what would it be like if they could walk through the doors of a church and hear that there's a God who sees them and says, I must come to your house today? You know what I know about a building? A building is just a building. Our church building is gonna have four walls. It's gonna have floors and bathrooms. It's just a building, but it can be a safe space that launches a friendship with God that changes their life and eternity. True story, <clears throat> we do baptisms every couple times a year. We do them a couple times a year. And as part of that baptism process, the staff meets with people if they want, if they want, if they want to meet, we want to hear their story a little bit about why they want to get baptized. And so I was part of these meetings and I was meeting with this one couple. And if you saw this couple from the outside, you, I, they kind of look like the typical base people. I, my assumption is they had grown up in church. They, they moved here. They got part of our church because, you know, they were already in. They were kind of like all together. And I thought this would be kind of a rather boring meeting. Not that meetings are boring. I like meeting people, but thought it would be very kind of cooker cutter. Um, and my meeting turned out to be very different. I was, I was really shocked. And so I said, well, tell me a little bit about your story and how you ended up at South Point. And they're like, well, um, well, you know, and it was a couple, it was a husband and wife. And so one spouse started sharing and said, yeah, like my parents took me to church when I was little, like elementary school, but they were never really engaged. I was never really engaged. It's just kind of a thing that we did. But by the time I got to high school and into college, like God wasn't a thing in my life. I didn't know God, didn't want God, was going to live my own life and, and kind of do my own thing and just really wasn't important to me. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I turned to the other person. I said to the spouse, I said, hey, tell me about your, your spiritual background. And we're like, the spouse said, well, we never went to church. And we're like, what? Yeah, like our family didn't go to church, but like I would go to my grandmother's and my grandmother would take us to like Christmas and Easter every once in a while. And, and this couple had gotten married and they had some young kids and they did what all of us knuckleheads do. When you're a knucklehead and you have kids, you don't want your kids to be knuckleheads. And so you go, I'm going to go to church because I want my kids to not turn out like I turn out. You know, you're like, I want them to avoid all the things that I avoid. So they showed up to church and, and here's what's amazing. And they said, listen, we sat in the chair, in the tree, not for a couple months, not for six months, not for a year, not for two years, but years. South Point was a safe place to hear that there was a God who made me, a God who loved me, a God who wanted to be my friend. And we've decided to say yes to Jesus and we want to get baptized. 
That's what this platform is all about, to launch friendships that change eternity. Which leads me to my third observation, which is this. The platform helped to lead to real life change. See, the church always has a problem. I don't understand this about Christians, and I wish we would all change. Christians keep asking non-Christians to act like Christians. Do you understand how backwards that is? Like, if I didn't know Jesus, I would do all the craziness. Like, I need everyone to understand. Without Jesus, the world is a busted, broken, hopeless place. But with Jesus, we have hope. And here's what I discovered. You don't ask people to change their behavior. You ask people to fall in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with Jesus, your actions and your behaviors will begin to change. When you believe Jesus is a big deal and you start to put Jesus first in your life, when you put Jesus over your girlfriend or your boyfriend, your husband, your wife, your job, your addiction, your desires, when you put Jesus number one, I promise you, things begin to change. And here's what I know. Zacchaeus... Zacchaeus didn't need a church class to know what he was doing was wrong. But he, when Jesus said, I must come stay with you, and he had dinner with him, and they began this friendship, Zacchaeus, who was a greedy, selfish person who only cared about, I mean, he was willing to rob his own people who had been conquered. He went from a greedy, selfish man to going, I give half of what I have to the poor. And if I've robbed anyone, I'll give back four times, which is above and beyond what the law required. Zacchaeus's life outside of the church began to change radically, not because the church beat him or guilted him, but because he was in love with a person named Jesus. And see, when you point people to having a relationship with Jesus, then behaviors change. Because what does it matter if people change behavior, but their heart hasn't changed? You see, what's on the inside will always show up on the That's why at South Point, we just point you to Jesus full of grace and truth, but it leads to real life change. And if I had to sum it all up, I would say this, I'd say it this way, here's how I'd kind of sum it up. Creating a permanent platform, a church building, a church home that allows for Jesus-led life change is a legacy worthy of my best. It's a legacy worthy of your best. It's a legacy worthy of our best. Now I wanna tell you something. I wanna share with you today the one question that I get asked more than any other question in the last probably 10 years. Now I've lived in this community 21 years. Matter of fact, my wife and I were celebrating our 25th anniversary all the way up in Baltimore. We were on a dance floor at midnight and someone said, hey, Pastor Matt. And I'm like, man, I can't even like, I can't even. Like everywhere I go, I know someone and people, people always come up to me and they always say, hey, Pastor Matt. You know what the number one question that I get is? When are you going to? Okay, y'all aren't following along with me. Okay, let's try this. Your second service, but come on now. When are you going to, when are you going to build a building? When are you going to have a church? When are you going to be like a real church? That's the number one question I always get. When are you, when are you going to have a building? And I give the exact same answer every time. And then I usually don't get asked any more questions. So okay, we're going to do a little role playing. So you can just ask me, Matt, when are we going to have a building? One, two, three. That is a great question. What does it take to have a building? What's the least favorite subject to talk about in church? No one ever talks to me about the building after that statement. <laughs> and here's what I discovered. As soon as you talk about money in church, the tension level rises, doesn't it? I mean, and I, listen, I get it. I totally understand that as soon as I start talking about money or giving, that you and I, that we already are frustrated because we feel so overwhelmed. Everywhere we go, there's already demand on our time and our resources. I mean, you go to the grocery store just to buy bread and milk, and they're like, do you want to give an extra dollar of that? I'm like, I just gave you a bunch of dollars. Why do I need to give you an extra dollar? You walk out of the store, and there's Girl Scouts, and they're just guilting you. You know, there's six cookies in there, and you're going to pay $8 for six cookies, and before you get home they're all gone and your wife's like where are you and you're like they're in my belly right and it's not just the girl scouts you go to the office right you go to the office thing and they're always passing around do you want to buy a frozen pizza that tastes really nasty to support my kids thing and you want to say no but then you feel really bad and then if you're like part of a part of a sports team you got to buy a raffle everywhere we go we're overwhelmed with demands on our time and our resources and so i get it i understand that when i talk about money and giving the tension goes up but I wanna ask us a serious, real question that loves me and online in here today. I wanna to show you a list. I wanna show you a list. Sports, I love sports. I played little league baseball as a kid. I love sports. But here's what I know about kiddie soccer and kiddie baseball and kiddie lacrosse and whatever other kiddie game you got your kids in. 
Sports can't change a human heart and impact eternity. And I want to say some of the parents, this is not a dig. This is, I wonder if we spend as much time as getting our kids in sports as developing them spiritually, we might have a different generation. The arts. I love good storytelling. I love great plays. I love people who can sing and act. And I, I like people who can create set designs. I love in a, in a show the diversity of people from the lighting and from the sound that's all needed. I love the arts. I think the arts is great. But the arts cannot change a human heart. The arts do not impact eternity. The scouts, I love them. I was a boy scout and I did get kicked out. And my girls were, were Girl Scouts. I love the Scouts. They do lots of amazing things. They do camping. They teach them great values. But here's what I discovered about the Scouts. The Scouts can't change the human heart or impact eternity. Education. If I was smart enough, I would be a quantum physicist. Unfortunately, I can't. I really believe that every single person should be a lifelong learner. I think we should be students, not critics. But here's what I know. Education can't change the human heart and will not impact eternity. And whatever hobby you have, whether it's golfing or fishing or hunting or quilting or pets or whatever it is that you do, they're great. But hobbies do not change human hearts and do not impact eternity. And what's amazing to me is that none of you feel bad when somebody in sports, art, scouts, or education or hobbies asks you for your money. And I wonder why I feel ashamed when I ask you to support the one thing, the one thing that can change the human heart, the one thing that can impact eternity, and it's not a church building, it's not a pastor, it's Jesus. And I wonder if it's okay for the church to not feel ashamed and guilty to go, hey, I think changing human lives is worth investing in. So I want you to do something today. When you came in, everyone got a packet. It's our launching a legacy packet. We know that since the beginning when we launched this back in October. And if you don't have one, you can raise your hand. The ushers will get you one. Now I want everyone to grab it. Go, please grab it. Everyone go grab it. Wave yourself. It's hot. Please just hold it. Just even if you don't hate me and never coming back, just hold it. And the reason I want you to hold it is I want you to know something. When you hold it, I want you to know something. It will not go into your wallet and take your money. Smile. Just because you hold it or have it doesn't mean it's going to take your money. This just has a bunch of information about our launching legacy initiative to build our first campus. It won't, it won't go into your wallet. It's for you. Now I want to speak to two groups of people here. The first group is the people that are already giving above and beyond to the general operating account. You are giving sacrificially to our launching legacy initiative to have our first building. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, you are making a big difference. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your sacrifice. At South Point, we never believe in equal giving. We believe in equal sacrifice. So for some of you, you're in the economic bracket where you're giving up going out to eat at McDonald's or a fast food place once a week so that you can give. Others of you may be putting off the purchase of a new car or a boat or a luxury item. And those financially look different, but it is equal sacrifice. So I want to say to everyone, thank you to all of those of you that are currently giving. To those of you that are undecided, to those of you that are newer to South Point that weren't here in October when we launched this, I want to invite you. Listen, no shame, no guilt. I just want to go, is this worthy of your investment? If you prayed and asked God, what would God have you to do? Would he want you to partner with us for creating a permanent platform? Platform that would launch Jesus-led life change into our community for generations to come. I can't answer that. Only you can. I want to give you a quick little bit of an update about where we're currently at. Our major site plan and our mechanical, electrical, and plumbing uh, plans have all been submitted to the county. We're currently getting responses. Um, and by the end of next week, we should have all those responses back. We're, we're currently in contact with about three or four different lenders, kind of trying to figure out the best rate and what will work best for the church. Um, we've touched base with about four or five general contractors that are local. One that's just a little bit outside to make sure that that goes. Then we'll do the open bid process. And God willing, we'd break ground somewhere between August, September, October, depending on how things move. That's kind of where we are on this phrase. And then I want to kind of give you a financial update. So way back when we launched this in October, uh, we did a Kickstarter offering. Listen, there are just tons of fees, soft costs, hundreds of thousands of dollars of soft costs associated with building a brand new building. What does it take to build a building? 
What's the least favorite subject to talk about in church? <laughs> okay, that's why we're doing it, right? So we had about $200,000 come in. Listen, if you have not given your Kickstarter offering, if you've come in and you would like to do that, you still have that opportunity. So between our Kickstarting offering and our pledge, we had about 1.8 million pledge. That means over 36 months, the 36 monthly budget of the 1.6 plus two would be 44.4. And monthly up to April, the monthly actual is 43.8. So we're, we're kind of trending right, about 99%. So again, thank you to everyone. Where we really like to be, is our $2 million target, which means with 30 months left, our monthly target would be 5124, which means we need about 25 families or 25 individuals to give about $250 above the um, general operating account giving um, to the regular. And you know what? If you can't do that, that's okay. If you give up, whatever it is that God moves you, we just want to be good stewards and let you know. And here's the question I always get asked when we kind of put the pledge card up here. I always get asked this question about pledge cards. Matt, why does the church need pledges? And here's the thing. Would you want us to make financial decisions with no idea what our budget was. If we had no idea what the budget was without pledges, we would just go, hey, we're going to build a $50, $50 million building and then not be able to build it. Or we'd go, hey, we're going to build a $1 million building we can't fit into and everyone hated and we'd have all this extra money. So pledges allow us and the lending institution to make wise financial decisions. And here's how the pledge card works. It kind of like on a monthly, weekly, or annual basis is kind of how you can let us know. So let's just use $100 as an example. Say, I want to give $100 monthly, which means over 30 months, that would be a certain amount of money. 30 times 100, right? Um, monthly, I want to do that. If you want to do yearly, maybe you're a business owner, you take all kind of your income in a lump sum. Maybe you say, no, I want to do weekly. I want to do, you know, $25 a week. That equals this. Um, and then you want to put your Kickstarting offering. And then you put the same thing on this other side. The big section with your name and stuff, please return to South Point and the other little end you keep. You can put that in the offering. You can mail it in. You can respond however you want. Please identify your gifts though for launching Legacy. If you don't put anything next to it, it just goes in the general operating. And we really want giving to go we're giving supposed to. And then here's the last thing. If you're here and you're going, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the property. I have some questions. It's really awkward. I can't yell from the middle of the sermon. Thank all of you for not doing that. Uh, I would like to ask a question about it. It's great. We're going to have an open town hall for the church June 6th at 6.30 at the Hilton um, Express Inn behind Texas Roadhouse. So what day did I say? Thursday, June 6th. 6.30, you're more than welcome. There's no childcare. We will have a little bit of coffee, water, and a few small desserts. But if you have questions, you are welcome. Hey, I just want to say one last thing. We really value people here at South Point. We have a saying that all people matter deeply to God. Our next steps to build a building are not about comfort and convenience. It's about impacting our communities for Jesus. Um, thank you for partnering and responding with us. Um, let me pray. God, our number one value is that Jesus is a big deal. The whole idea is that God, you gave your best. You didn't set heaven's junk down here. You sent your one and only son to rescue us. You were all in. You're willing to die so that we could live. God, those of us that have said yes to you do the same thing. We live for you. We give our best for you. God, the hope of the world is Jesus. There's a world around us in hurting and in pain and in dysfunction, in need of a savior. And you've given us, this community of people, the greatest hope to steward. God, may we be a place where Jesus is such a big deal that we put ourselves second. And then we create a platform that allows people to see Jesus so they can say yes to you and experience real life change. This is our prayer. And everyone said, amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.